Hello there everyone! Last episode we took a look at Space Marines and Chaos there and while there weren't really a bunch of new type of ships that we could look forward to, there were still some interesting things in the background to be excited about with the potential of the lore, including the Primaris Marines and of course the potential of, what is it, demon ships investing or at least contributing to the forces of Chaos. There was still a lot of stuff to be potentially excited about but nothing really direct in terms of like how the Imperial Navy mechanic has looked for what they are going to have in additional, additional ships. But now we are going to take a look into Eldar and see how exactly they changed in, from the tabletop to Armada 1. And trust me, there have been some changes. Some of the ships themselves have actually been reworked a little bit, which I will explain as we get to some of them. But let's explain a little bit the rules and mechanics for the tabletop itself to at least give you a little bit of understanding on why the Eldar function the way they do and a lot of that comes down to their mo movement of course the hollow feels a big thing and the fact that they are pretty well fragile as well as terms of they're like the easiest type of ships to hit more often than not when you do not include the hollow field which interestingly enough I may be misunderstanding the rules a little bit for the hollow field there but it says that for like regular weaponry that rely on the gunnery table I'll d demonstrate what that is there but basically anything that has a chance of missing or has like accuracy modifiers to it so that's like your macro cans in general there mostly it doesn't seem like the hollow field actually affects them in, in any way at all which is a little bit different than how Armada 1 has it because there is that like 50% chance to ignore an attack that hits you but let's also keep in mind the lowest you can go from what I talked about before in previous episodes is that you can't get lower on a dice roll 4 or higher basically to hit so basically that means that Eldar are technically a little more durable than they are in Armada 1 with that said so that could be why the hollow field was changed slightly to kind of help make up for just how fragile Eldar would have been otherwise with their 25 armor all around they would have died immensely fast but since we are talking about a real-time strategy game that actually changes the dynamic in more ways than one I've shown in a handful of videos you could just straight up dodge the projectiles whereas in a turn-based combat game that is not quite the same effect there for you're kind of forced to take the hits even though you have the mobility and those little elusive traits that Eldar have in fact like I mentioned before in like just some of my Eldar mission videos in general there the Eldar can actually move twice in a single turn and how that exactly functions is that they do their move normally in like the movement phase which is the first phase of a turn there and they have their movement based on the stats of their ship there they're also like a nerf factor that never quite made the Armada 1 which is the facing of the sun there since really all the Eldar ships rely on the solar sails which is where they get their movement the placement of the sun also had a factor on how fast the Eldar ships gone but those are all based on each individual ship so you'll get to see that as we look at the stat layout for like the Foy Stalker and the clips and all of them but basically Eldar had their move as normal there they actually had a 180 degree turn there from what I understand so they can co turn themselves completely around especially for like the second movement phase which happens after they do their shooting there so does that sound familiar that is exactly how the falls maneuver works there technically and their speed isn't really reduced for a second movement phase either at least outside what I just said about the sun facing itself but they can go in there into the target there get the ideal placement because they actually for like all the other ships I talked about so far, Chaos, Space Marines, Imperial Navy, Mechanicus, they all had a minimum movement range that they had to go if they were going to do a legal move basically. They could, unless they did like a burn retros, which is the only way all those ships, all those other factions I mentioned could actually turn on a dime, not move at all. They, Eldar don't really have to rely on that. Hell, most of the special orders that we talked about like was it come to new heading which is like your high energy turns for all intents and purposes was it all ahead full which is your speed boost Eldar don't need to do that there hell it's not even an option for them for like things like all ahead full they just have their movement there you can go however distance you wish based on whatever your strategy is going to be you move forward a certain amount of distance and then after you do your shooting in the second phase which is the shooting phase then you can just turn your ships around just disengage as we've seen with Falls Maneuver and the Wraith Bone Shift, which in all honesty is probably what the Wraith Bone Shift honestly was, was 
to kind of serve as a sub substitute for that second movement phase since we are talking about a real-time strategy, real-time tactics type of play style, and not the turn base. So, in all intents and purposes, that's what the Wraithbone Shift is. And the Falls Maneuver did require a skill slot there, so it's going to be interesting to see with the new mechanics and changes they're going to be doing to the factions and multiplayer in general, having the Admiral Ship the only ship capable of using skill slots if the Falls Maneuver becomes more baseline or just becomes more difficult for Eldar coming into Armada 2. Eldar also had like the fragile trait to him there as we know all too well. They were made a, a lot weaker in the ramming attempt and that's mainly because Eldar were not even allowed to ram at all because for you to ram in the tabletop version you had to use your all ahead full, your speed boost to actually have the option of a ram attempt. So the fact that Eldar do less damage is mainly because of that there, and if you're looking down on the bottom right here on the page, which you may have already read on the critical hits tab, this is why Eldar are a lot more fragile and a lot more vulnerable to taking critical hits, because normally, anytime you did damage to the hull for the tabletop version, you would roll a dice, and every time you rolled a six, you would then get a critical hit. Outside of like specialized weapons like, of course, the Space Marines Bombardment Cannon, and the Eldar trait here, where instead of rolling a 6, you basically have a 50-50 chance of getting that critical hit, and then you roll additional dice to determine what actually got damaged there, which is basically shown right here, in fact. This is what the critical hit table looks like. It is different for Eldar in, in general, but this is roughly what it's, it's similar to how Imperial Navy Chaos and all that function as well. You basically roll 2d10 there, or 2d6 rather, I don't know where 2d10 came from, but based on the roll there, you get different results. And just so you know, the first 6, 7 type of critical results are all basically temporary damage, or just damage to the hull in general. So these all, the top half, are what can be repaired, and technically, for hit and runs, which for all intents and purposes is like lightning strikes, boring torpedoes, assault boats, all those that you see the worrying hit and run attacks are basically anything that can cause only temporary damage, critical hits rather. So that's what the top 6 is for because when you do a hit and run attack you're only allowed to roll 1d6 and of course if you roll a 1 you basically fail to roll which is why you don't see a 1 result here. But if you do a 2 to 6 outside of modifiers to boost that or hinder that further you get the critical hit of that result there. And it functions exactly as you would expect for the Imperial Navy and Annals as well. It's just worded completely differently, but they are generally the same theme here otherwise. And that brings us over now to the weaponry of the Eldar, I think, we're going to talk about next. As they're already showing here on the left, we have the Pulsars, we have the Weapon Batteries, which is all intents and purposes, the Star Cans, and of course the Torpedoes. And the wording here, well... To give you understand what you're looking at, the Pulsars of course are a lance type weapon as while I never worded it directly in the last two episodes, I think we already know what lances are. They're low damage weapons that are always considered to be hitting their targets so they almost never suffer any modifiers with the exception of the hollow field. Hell, I never even pointed out that the hollow field actually could negate Novacans, boarding attempts, hit and run attacks, even all sorts of other effects that never made an Armada 1 so in theory. Eldar could have been even more ridiculous if they were able to mitigate a lot of that damage just by the hollow field being tuned, or at least being true to what it was in the tabletop version for consideration. But Pulsars, the one unique trait they had is they actually do three shots, and the reason for that is of course the wording here. Every time you get a successful hit on the target, you get to roll another dice up to three times for each Pulsar Lance. And how it's going to be shown on the stat sheet there is each pulsar is basically going to be strength of one there. So if you see two strength on like an aurora, that basically of course means it has two pulsars. Whereas a void stalker will have four pulsars, and of course eclipse there potentially basically having three. The weapon batteries for the star cans though, which is applied to the fact that Eldar have better accuracy than all the other factions. Unfortunately, the star cans are probably underutilized or not really fully used to their full potential because they are more of a rapid fire, constant harassment type of weaponry. 
instead of doing like full burst damage, which we know Eldar to be all in general because of the torpedoes, the bombers, and of course the sheer potential of the pulsars. In this case, weapon the weapon batteries, the higher accuracy is worded here on the it makes the weapons more accurate, which is what it means by shifting or talks about the gunnery table here. Counts as closing, which means no matter the facing of the target, it's basically assumed that the target's flying towards you, towards you, which means it's a little bit easier to hit than it were would be if it was flying sideways or flying away from you. And of course torpedoes, the reason torpedoes are a lot more effective in Armada 1, straightforward, normally defensive turrets need a 4, 5, or 6 for each for each turret you have on the cruiser or the frigate there. Which means they are pretty good at shooting down torpedoes, especially when you consider the torpedoes are always in a clump there. They're not spread out as you would for Armada 1, but in the case of Eldar torpedoes, you need 6s there to kind of reverse the roll as far as Eldar are easier to critical hit, but the torpedoes and bombers are a lot more harder to kill. Hell, it, this may not be known to you as far as Eldar torpedoes, but they completely ignore armor in the actual real-time game, Armada 1. But to, where that mechanic came from is the fact that you can just straight up re-roll the dice when shooting a torpedo at the hull of a ship there, making them a lot more reliable and a lot more dangerous. Eldar bombers and fighters are also a lot more potent as we already know and the ruling, the wording for the Eldar fighters and bombers is the exact same for like the strike cruisers or the Sunderhawks rather for space marines as well as the Manta bomber. I may have forgotten to talk about the Sunderhawk a little bit last episode but the wording is exactly the same as it is on here for the Eldar attack craft so they did could have very easily have all, have all functioned the same way, having either a better chance to avoid destruction, having extra hit points. But Tindalos decided to make them all slightly different and have their own nuances there. Because the Sunderhawks have the devil, was it, the extra hit point there to kind of make them a little more durable. The Eldar have that baseline 30% chance to ignore destruction destruction when they're hit on top of the fact that when you increase the the piloting crew there that basically boosts up to a 60% chance making them incredibly resilient and the Mance bombers well they just made that baseline for the entire Tau fleet basically by making an upgrade to give you an extra health point so each of these three factions have functioned completely differently there but the wording for those three ships and Eldar in general are all basically the same as what you see here. It's basically a 4, 5, or 6 to kind of like ignore losing the ship or having it run out of fuel or ammo after destroying torpedoes or just surviving a hit that would have normally killed it or at least rather making it a lot more hard to hit, kind of like how the torpedoes functioned. Now before I talk about the ships there in general, I want to explain a little bit how de determining the amount of firepower, the number of dice you have for attacking an opposing ship functions here because it's really important, at least in the case of Eldar, because of the fact that hollow fields exist there. Never mind the fact that it functions differently or the feel is a lot more differently. Mind you, I never played the tabletop game personally, let alone Eldar. The closest I ever came to was like playing a tablet version called Battlefleet Gothic, was it Leviathan? which is mainly focused around the Tyranids and there were no Eldar in that game. So I have no idea how Eldar personally felt there, but this can be a little bit overwhelming because this is the gunnery table right here and basically modifiers for if the target's coming towards you, moving sideways or moving away. So to make this simple for you, I brought, I looked at the damage, the stat sheets for like the Retribution and it has a firepower of 12 for its macro cans. So just for the sake of helping make this a little bit easier to understand, if the Retribution was shooting at something that was flying towards it at like 6,000 unit range. This is basically without modifiers. So 6,000 unit range is where modifiers are not a thing outside of like special abilities. So it would ha you would have like 8 dice on a target, 8 shots at a target basically to try and breach through its shields and damage its armor. It doesn't matter if it's another Retribution, another like cruiser or that. It would be 8 dice there if the target's flying towards you at 6,000 unit range. But we'll just say if two Retributions were shooting at each other in like a mirror match, so they would have their size to each other, that rapidly drops down to like four dice. You get four shots at them, and this of course accounts for the fact that they are moving sideways, they're a lot more hard to hit, and they can dodge and maneuver that way. So the Hollow Field basically moves this uh, chart over as far as your stat basic chance to hit, and this is where Eldar become a lot more difficult to do damage to because as you can see it rapidly rapidly drops down as you get 
further and further to the right, which basically is the number of dice you get for shooting at escort ships and torpedoes on the far right there, and it's substantially weaker than all these other modifiers. It may be a little bit confusing to understand at first, so I'm hoping that gave you a little bit of basic outline, because if you were shooting at Foy Stalker, it automatically assumes your sh it moves the target to the right, and when you consider the fact that Eldar can move twice, they're almost never flying towards you anyway, do that second move because they already shot technically so you're already having a really poor chance to hit them in general to give you a better basic understanding on how where the inspiration came from for the hollow field in armada one eldar would be really difficult to hit almost all the time because of that second movement that they have available and that second movement is when torpedoes and bombers are moving so once they are torpedoes, their fighters do their movement, do their attacks, do their damage, then they can freely move away or move to an awkward positioning there, greatly minimizing the chance you have of hitting them. Now that all the boring stuff's out of the way, let's quickly have a look at all the ships there. I'm going to do things a little bit differently. I'm going to show you the frigates first before we move on over to the, back, the cruisers and then move on to the exciting stuff which is the craft worlds and the Drukhari or the Dark Eldar. I'm going to have to start learning how to pronounce their name properly, so you'll have to forgive me on that. But, this is the stat sheet here. Every The frigates are probably the only thing that are true to what they were in Armada 1, aside from maybe the Shadow. But, you can see on the stats here, they all have their same weapon right here. The Prow Weapon ra Battery is all technically the Star Cannon. And because this is a turn-based game, how the weapon batteries perform for this game, for the tabletop, is a lot more different than, like I said already, in Armada 1. Turn-based... They have to do damage over time, which can be tricky to fully utilize, so ultimately, the torpedoes and bombers, and I believe the pulsars, have been ramped up a tiny bit more to help alleviate the loss of potential power, and at least burst damage, that Eldar would have had access to through the star cannons. And you can see, even see on the stats here, it has three terms for movement speed. That's what the sun, was it, the solar sails have for their movement. It, functions completely differently there and of course the movement is drastically different for the case of the frigates itself. They don't have all ahead full to kind of like get extra speed so your facing was incredibly important for getting that mobility you want and not being like overwhelmed and being caught in close with and a really tenacious adversary especially with like all the macro batteries with the what is it the whole field being a little more limited especially if you got in close. So what does this speed ray mean there exactly? Well the 10 for these frigates basically means if you're flying towards the suns, which means your solar sails are not gaining effective coverage. The 20 is if you're flying away from the sun, and the 30 is if it's to your side. So you're going to more often not have the 30 speed, the max speed, if you position yourself properly. But if it does, despite the mobility and the difficulty of effectively hitting Eldar, the sun if they get really bad movement speed on either of their phases, preferably when they're trying to disengage on their second movement, then they are really damn screwed, I think it's safe to say, because they're slower than pretty much every other sh fleet ship in the game, because hell, even Emperor can outrun it if their facing was really badly done. And I mentioned it before, 4 plus armor, this is the lowest you can get out of any hit chance, so it's a 50-50 chance, and the hull field helped alleviate that and negate that the fragile state of Eldar in the Armada 1 just a little bit by making macro cans not as effective it seems like. But all in all it basically comes down to the same there as far as a macro can is shot. Now let's have a quick look at the Aurora there. There's one important thing I never talked about and the fact that their point defense, their turret count for all these Eldar ships is zero. And a lot of this probably comes down to the fact that you can evade the fighters and missiles a lot better this way. Whereas in Armada 1, you, they kind of relentlessly chase you down until they get shot. So, you don't have that convenience there. And of course, the fighters were supposed to prov help provide a little bit of defenses there. And of course, you can also shoot at them with your capital ship weaponry and the star cans and even the pulsar if you were so daring. So, this is a big change to the resilience that the Eldar have there. Now, the only other ship that was basically untouched as far as how its weaponry functions is the Shadowed here. There was never a carrier version of the Shadow, that was Tindalos' own variation, mind you, but this is what the Shadow is in general, and of course, with the Star Cans functioning so much different, this ship would have been so much different there for like the tabletop version, because you get 12 firepower, a lot of dice damage with that, whereas opposed to 
how it is in Armada 1, it seems kind of like a lackluster ship, potentially, I would argue anyway, since the torpedoes can be re relatively easy to dodge if you're not in close, and the star cans need to do damage over time, so it's kind of like a double-edged sword a little bit. You ideally want to be behind your ship, or behind an enemy ship there, to maximize your star can potential, but at the same time, that makes it so the torpedoes almost never hit, because it gives them that much more time to take evasive maneuvers, or just sidestep out of the way if they have the speed for it. But now, let's talk about where Tindalos tweaks things, shall we? And we are going to start off with the Eclipse. Because the Eclipse here, just to put it out for you, is not a battle cruiser. It had six health points, it was a, a variation of the Shadow in general, and it was the cruiser ship that had the Pulsar cannons. Hell, it had two Pulsars, which is similar to what the Aurora had. It didn't even have a third Pulsar shot. Mind you, it's still incredibly expensive in comparison to most other cruisers and light cruisers mind you but that is due to like the hollow field and probably his resilience there but it also was the carrier ship as well so Tindalos have drastically retweaked what the Eclipse is because it serves a battle cruiser role its health pool alone makes a drastic difference for how fragile Eldar were at least in as you were leveling up a fleet there the Aurora's were pretty flimsy, they could die relatively quickly if you didn't know how to control them, and of course, with a plane with Eldar as a brand new fleet made that really difficult because you didn't know how to exactly control them just yet. It's one, it wasn't until you got access to the Eclipse there with his extra health pool that you could kind of brute force your way to victory a little bit there. And I almost forgot about the Solaris class cruiser here, for it also got drastic tweaks there as far as how it functions there in Armada 1, mainly because it was turned into a carrier ship, but the original Solaris in the tabletop version was really just a star cannon boat. It had nothing but star cannons equipped on it, and it was pretty damn good at it, because the firepower rating on the ship was basically a little bit higher than the macro cans on like a tyrant, I believe. Well, maybe not all the macro cans, mind you, but it was still pretty fearsome when you consider that you're getting like this firepower here that's all at once as opposed to over time in Armada 1. So that is another example of how they tried to tweak the ships there to make them a little more potent and encourage that hit and run type of style where Star Cans kind of didn't uh, function that role very well. It is interesting to see if they should have made them a lot more burst centric. Even though technically even the tabletop version has Shuriken Cannons which are basically what the Star Cans are and they were more rapid fire type of weapons anyway, I believe, and not really big, impactful cannons. Now everyone prepare to have your minds blown, for we are going to have a look at the Void Stalker, and I need to point out right now, it may seem pretty straightforward, it may seem pretty normal, aside from maybe like the bomber count on the Void Stalker, could, is a little bit different. Take a look at the fire arcs on these weapons. The, both the pulsars were able to shoot sideways as well, they had a 180 degree arc, as well as the star cans themselves. Just imagine how fearsome this thing would be if it could fire at 180 degrees the entire time and not with the star cans being forced to lock on like they currently do in Armada 1. It has the same health, it has the same kind of speed, potentially the same kind of speed anyway. 225 is basically what? It is actually a little bit slower in the tabletop version, but again, keep in mind, Wraith Bone Shift isn't really a truly a second movement speed. Because it is only like 1.5 seconds and it gives you like, what, only 1,000 units distance. So it's not truly a one-to-one -one comparison. This Void Stalker in the tabletop version is actually a little bit slower. But it does, again, like all the other Eldar ships, get to move twice and it has 180 degree turning speed. But, oh boy. You thought the Void Stalker was a nightmare for four. Just imagine it doing what it's doing while flying sideways, for crying out loud. It may not get its full Pulsar fire in as an effect, hell. That's something I never pointed out, is the Pulsars had a 90 degree fire arc. They were not direct fire weaponries like they are currently, that you had to manually control or be flying directly towards your opponent for the auto fire system to effectively engage. So there's a lot to take in for just how the Void Stalker functions, because it is a drastic difference, never mind all the other nuances I mentioned. And while, alas, there is no other type of new ships available for Eldar there, at least the Corsair variant, the Eldari Corsairs, there is still room, of course, with new ships, the possibility of the Craft Worlds and the Corsairs possibly working together. I, I think due to the lore and how they 
function though, it, they're probably not going to be considered the same type of fleet as I may have suggested in earlier videos. It's more of Tau that may be victim to that, unless they're drastically different because the rules for the, the Tau merchant fleets and the custodian type of Eldar fleet are basically the exact same, so they probably will be uh, integrated together with each other. So we will see, but there are no new type of ships there from what I could tell for the Corsairs, so let's move on over to new exciting stuff, shall we? I bored you long enough, to, even with this display of the Void Stalker. Now the Craft World ships, in all in all, are pretty much exactly what I already showed you with the Corsair Eldar, but there are fine differences there, just in the ship specifications, and a couple of the rules themselves are a little bit different, because the one... One thing I haven't talked about yet was the fact that the Corsairs are really fragile in boarding actions and not really the best at doing boarding themselves. They get like negative modifiers to their dice roll, but in the case of the Craft World Eldars, they do not suffer any negative traits and instead, if you want to infest the points in them in the tabletop version, you can actually enhance their boarding potential to be almost equivalent to what the Space Marines are. In fact, I'm pretty certain it is the same outside of other special rules that aren't related to direct boarding itself. Because the wording, the wording of the Aspect Warriors, which is the upgrades for enhancing your military crew or your boarding crew there, is pretty much the exact same as far as direct boarding and lightning strike hit and run attacks there. You get plus one or plus two benefit to your, uh, your chance of getting critical damage as well as a plus one to your hit and run attacks, which is your lightning strikes and boarding to get there. And like I said earlier in the video there, that basically means, outside of any other modifiers, that's basically a guaranteed critical hit in the tabletop version. So you would just roll the dice you see already on the right here to determine what is the effect is that you're going to have on the ship. You do have to infest additional points to get these Aspect Warriors, but you do not suffer the negative effects of a weaker crew like with the Corsairs just right away, so it makes them more potent just on that alone, but there aren't really any other additional rules to them outside maybe like the ghost ships which we'll talk about after the ships themselves are displayed. And speaking of those new ships, let's just start putting them on display, shall we? First off, we're going to start off with the frigates here. Unfortunately, from here on out, we're going to have a much more like reduced list of fighters that are available or ships available especially for things that are not orcs and was it the Tau fleets I think because everything else has like maybe two three cruisers including like the Necrons and all that so there's not going to be a whole lot to show as far as diversity here but we're going to show you the frigates and the shadow hunter and they are technically not truly a frigate I suppose because they're more for like point defense for all intents and purposes of shooting down fighters as well as like bombers so they don't quite have a Pulsar Lance, they have the options, like all the Craft World ships actually have the option of picking their weapon there, and I believe that all modifies the points of the ships there on the top right, but I couldn't for the life of me really find that, I don't think. I'm going to have to double check on that to be sure, but they don't have a Pulsar like the regular Eldar, at least the Shadow Hunters don't, but what their Shadow Lance is, is all intents and purposes, just a regular Lance. It just fires directly out there with his burst damage, and like I said, they are a lot more effective at shooting down fighters and torpedoes, so it'll be interesting to see how these little fellas function in Armada 2, since we don't really have a means to directly fire at torpedoes and like the bombers themselves. We're relying heavily on the point defense and technically just right away from them to kind of like give us more time for our point defense to shoot them down, which Funk would function so dramatically different if we have ways for like these Shadow Hunters to kind of contribute in the fight as well. But ultimately they may just get additional point defense or even rerolls to the effectiveness of the point defense kind of like how Tau do with their messengers. Now we're going to jump right into the cruisers there because the Craft Worlds don't actually have a light cruiser so we're expecting, I would imagine, a light cruiser to take the place to complement the majority of the Craft World fleet I think is safe to say but like what we, what we just shown with the frigates, the Wraith ship here has access to choosing either Pulsar Lance or Torpedoes and Bombers. So they have that versatility and I am for the life of me assuming that they cost more. Because 160 points when we already looked at the Eclipse and all that there is a lot more cheaper. But it also has access to the same kind of components that the basically the Eclipse does. In, in the tabletop version. Also, I need to point out one very important thing, it's the armor. 
all the craft world ships have five plus armor, so that's fifty armor for all intents and purposes on model one. These things are far more resilient and they still have a hollow field to boot. They still have the same mobility, they still technically have the same kind of speed, so these things are gonna be a lot more in your face, I think it's safe to say. A lot more tenacious, a lot more aggressive if they can get the killing blow, while still having pretty much the exact same kind of firepower you already know with the Corsairs. Which may mean they're going to be a nightmare if Tindalos give these things a battleship. Because they don't even have a battleship either, so imagine the Void Stalker with even more armor potential. And while I said they do not have a battleship here, they do have like a hero ship available which may take the place of a battle cruiser here. But the Eldar Dragon ship is just a, a much more potent type of bat was a cruiser mind you. It has the same kind of health points, it has the same kind of armor, but you straight up have the possibility of three pulsar lances on it and just more torpedoes, hell eight torpedoes at that. It may be just as fragile as regular cruiser so it's possible this could get the battle cruiser treatment. Like with the Eclipse there, with less tweaks and modifications for it, but this thing is still looking very dangerous and very vicious. And hell, this is like the only ship in the tabletop version that has access to like boarding ships. With like I talked about the Aspect Warriors being a lot more effective at boarding, you do have the possibility of boarding ships and as well for Craft World Fleet. And now this next ship, while technically it's not a standard type of ship available to the craft worlds, we are going to have a look at Uriel's uh, flagship, the Flame of Shoran. Because this, without doubt, I would love to see a more standardized version of at least of this kind of design. It may not technically be the same ship there, but for those who aren't really understanding the lore here, it already says on the right, in fact, Uriel was basically an uh, outcast prince, I think of Yandan, which is one of the craft worlds, which is specific to, like, the Tyranid invasion. I think it's Behemoth that attacked, uh, Yandan. And there's this story arc where Uriel comes back to try and save the craft world, I believe. I'm not really the most first. Oh, it's High Fleet Kraken, never mind. I thought it was Behemoth or something at first, but this is his own personal flagship here. It is a lot more durable. It is, for all intents and purposes, a battle cruiser from what we know it there. Eight health points, a lot more durable, and it even has the same... The firepower you kind of would expect, although it only has two pulsars, but a ridiculous amount of star cannons. And while that may be underwhelming for Armada 2, I'd love to see what Tindalus would do to tweak the ship to make it more standardized and make it part of the Craft World fleet. I'm really excited to see the ship. Now, sadly, that is all the ships available for the Craft Worlds that we know of there, but there are still rules for like the ghost ships that I mentioned earlier there, and basically. These are not ex exciting as the demon ships of the chaos, mind you. They just retweak a lot of the rules that the craft worlds have access, are currently utilizing. For so to give you a basic rundown of what the ghost ships really are, you basically remove the crew there and make yourself really weak to boarding, kind of like the corsairs do already. But you lose the fragile trait of your craft, your Eldar ships there. So critical hits are a lot harder to inflict on a ghost ship because basically they don't have a crew so they manage to enhance the superstructure as a result. There are also other factors here kind of like if you ever fail uh, was it a leadership role to do like your lock-ons your brace for impacts and all that there there is always the chance of them just uh, not doing anything at all which is kind of a death sentence for Eldar if they were to stop listening to your orders there so there is that risk of that is for all intents and purposes like the bonehead type of trait in Blood Bowl for like your big guys if you ever played that game but otherwise the f how the ghost ships function you just swap the vulnerabilities of the Corsairs that the, the craft worlds do not have with each other for all intents and purposes they're not nearly as exciting as say like the demon ships now let's talk about the Dark Eldar, the Drukhari as it were there, for they're sort of a hybrid between regular ships that we already talked about with the Imperium Chaos and a little bit of the nuances to Eldar, mainly because of the hollow fields would be the only real thing that even relates them to Eldar in all honesty, which they call the Shadow Field instead, but for all intents and purposes how the Dark Eldar function is actually quite drastically different for they don't have the two movements every turn like the Corsairs and Craft Worlds do, but they do have means to turn relatively easily and simply because they just immediately succeed under come to new heading like special order, which is 
which is the high energy turn that we're already used to. They still have the higher leadership that we're already aware of there for what Eldar are already bringing Armada 1, and they are a little bit interesting on the boring actions. They're more aggressive and they're more effective at boring. They don't suffer any penalties there, but after, there is a weird little interaction here that after the first round of doing boardings, they have like a bonus modifier, but afterwards it becomes a negative one for whatever reason. So how this will function for Armada 2 is going to be interesting because do are they um, will they get bonus to like boarding the enemy ship but become weak when they're bored themselves? That would be an interesting way they could do it in Armada 2 since the Dark Elder are supposed to be very brutal and vicious anyway. So that would fit with their personality and their dynamic a little bit there. But you already can see it in the wording on the shadow field there on the right is basically as you already know with the hollow field. It functions exactly as the Hall Field does, it's just completely different flavor text there, just called a Shadow Field instead of a Hall Field, but everything else, the wording is as you know it there. And also, while I did talk about the boring already, about being like a plus one modifier, negative one modifier, they also have this special trait for slave taking here for like their lightning strikes and hit and run type attacks, so the only thing I'm not really certain about is if this would be hindered by the boring actions we would talk about before because the boring actions of course is like the the boarding parties we do on the broad side there when we're getting point blank range so maybe this is a completely separate thing i don't know how these would interact with each other in armada 2 in all honesty because we never really seen much differentiation between the lightning strikes and the regular boring potential aside for like maybe favors and even then those like the corn favor upgrades for like demon lightning strikes the Bale Tan, uh, the Avatar of Kane there also giving like additional enhancement to your lightning strike, but those just allowed your lightning strikes to do like permit damage, so this is a little bit of a different dynamic altogether because it makes them more effective, a lot more reliable, as well as it has a really odd wording here where you can forfeit your critical hit result. Instead, like, at least lore-wise, flavor-wise, you're just stealing slaves to increase your victory point count there which doesn't really have any impact for Armada in general with how our game plays out because it's all or nothing, but victory points do matter for like the purposes of game. Since there is like partial victory and there are like turn timers for your your battles there. So this would determine, at least in a very minor sense, on who would be the actual victor or at least get partial victories that way. So I would like to see Tindalos make a twist on this to make it like a factor for Armada 2, especially since it could greatly hinder morale. Instead of doing critical hits, imagine the slave taking mechanic being as a way to cripple the morale of a crew there, make them more likely to insubordinate. That would be an interesting dynamic there. It remains to be seen if that's gonna how that if that is how it's gonna work though. Now let's talk about some of the tools that the Drakari have to bear, because ultimately their weaponry is not all that much different than what the Eldar, the Aldari have to bring, aside from maybe like the Shadow Lance, the Shadow Pulsar there. It's it's slightly different, it's tweaked slightly differently, but it's still technically all the same as far as weaponry. It's just the other like upgrade options, the unique mechanics that they have available to them. Like the Mimic Engine here just allows them to basically transform the appearance of their ship into any other ship there, their adversary's fleet. And how that functions in the tabletop game is if you're outside a certain amount of range to not get like identified, you basically cannot be attacked in the first turn there. And it also allowed you to kind of like deploy closer for all intents and purposes to the middle of the map there, which is going to be an interesting dynamic, a fun little dynamic for getting super aggressive with the, the Drukhari there. It may not seem that significant at first, but when you consider the fact that if you are going to be playing an aggressive type of fleet, you're pinning, you get to your opponent that much faster, which means they are stuck more to the corner of the map and they have a hard time evading you. So for fairy mobile fleets or fairy, or fleets that have like means to kind of like outmaneuver you, they're going to be a lot more restricted and a lot more restrained if you go that kind of route. As far as how the mimic engines will function visually in game fluff wise, I could not tell you for the life of me there. First impressions, if they want to be lazy, Tindalos that is, you could just make it function very similar to how the supercharged void shield already currently works, where you can't be attacked for like 10, 20 seconds or whatnot. 
Really hard to say though, it's something to be excited about because they could go all sorts of different directions with this Mimic engine. They also have access to something called an Impaler Assault Module, which for all intents and purposes is just an additional type of boarding option available to you. This is actually a weapon though, and not so much like a different type of assault craft though. Assault craft, though. And since Dark Eldar are like the, the Craft World Eldari where you can choose your weaponry upgrade, you are kind of forfeiting torpedoes or just regular bombers in general to have access to this, but it is a far more potent and a, a far more durable type of uh, assault craft with that said. So it's almost a guaranteed critical hit of some so of sorts, and like with the slave taking rules, you do have the option of taking slaves there, but it is very potent as another way to do critical hits and it doesn't suffer from the normal hit and run traits with like originals or traditional assault crafts. So you could do permanent damage with this type of ship there and it is a different kind of uh, boarding option available to you. So you can equip the ship to have even more boarding options available and really cripple a ship down if for whatever reason you do not want to go with the straight up burst damage and just turn your adversary into a blazing wreck in a hurry. There isn't really anything new to say about the attack crafts themselves, like we already gone over the Eldar fighters, so they function the exact same way. And we already seen the Star Cans, the Dark Weapon Eldar Battery, so they function the same as the Star Cans, but the Phantom Lance, the big difference here is that you just roll a single dice to determine the number of hits you have on the target, whereas opposed to the El, what is it, the Eldari uh, Pulsars, you just, you roll, you keep rolling basically until you miss a shot up to three times, which is a little bit different and a little more consistent for the Phantom Lances to do their damage, because you have a good chance of five and six to just do two hits as opposed to one or three. But they have one final trick up their sleeves, and that is the Leech Torpedo. You can choose this weapon to fire as opposed to regular dumb fire torpedoes and I don't, it doesn't say anything about it having any tracking components to it there but if you were to hit a target with this thing it would cause an immediate engine critical hit. A temporary one mind you but it would slow down the target there and make it a lot more easier to board, a lot more easier to harass and a lot more easier to keep it from chasing you. So this provides an interesting dynamic for at least the Dark Eldar, the Drukari, not having their two moves a turn. So they are a little bit slower than the regular Eldar, but they don't also rely on the solar sail mechanic that we showed you already. So they are traditional movement in this case, and this will allow them with the Leech Torpedoes to kind of keep ships that are trying to chase them down. It'll be interesting to see if you can slow down frigates with the Leech Torpedoes, but it's an interest, a new dynamic that Dar the Drukari bring to bear, and it's something you need to take seriously. Is something you can repair, but mind you, with our emergency repairs on cooldown, it's not like you're going to have easy access to it. Now we're going to end off on a bit of a sad note, at least for the tabletop version, because there's only actually two type of ships available for the Drukari there. One is a frigate and one's a regular cruiser, so we're going to be ending off on a bit of a dour note. But that also means that we're going to be seeing brand new type of ships to kind of fill that void that Tindalos is going to be bringing to us, so... There is still exciting possibilities, it's just really difficult to tell you what exactly to get excited for, alas. So let's have a look at their one capital ship cruiser, the Torture Class Cruiser. And like I mentioned already, you can choose what upgrade to have onto it there, but for both the frigate and this cruiser, you're stuck with only the star cans, the prow guns. And then everything else you kind of have to fight over to see what you like better there. You have access to the Impaler, Phantom Lance. Two sets of bombers, I would imagine, here for the launch bays and four torpedoes. So it's pretty straightforward otherwise, but like I said, the speed, for all intents and purposes, these ships would be going what? About like 262, I think it is, for like the Nova and basically the Hunter. These things are going to be going pretty fast for a standard cruiser, for crying out loud. And a light cruiser is going to go even faster, but they, don't, they wouldn't have access to a Wraithbone shift for all intents and purposes, unless Tindalos decides to retweak the Drukari fleet to incorporate that in there. But I don't think they're going to do that, because hell, these things don't even have the 180 degree turn. They have much more effective high energy turns, mind you, so it'll be interesting to see if that becomes like their Falls Maneuver. But it'd be on like, I don't know, a limited charge of some sort or limited in the uh, even more restricted kind of cooldown. But this is what the torture class is all in all. It's got the same 5 plus armor, so it's a little more able to take a f take damage in a fight there while still having a hollow field. It's going to be, of course, no different than the craft worlds that we already saw. 
and the Corsair is almost is basically no different. It even has access to the Paler module as well. So it makes it pretty damn potent potentially for a frigate, mind you, because everything else is a lot weaker otherwise. I would imagine it would cost a lot more to have an impaler on a frigate, mind you, but it is the one thing that would not actually get weaker if you were to put it on a frigate. So there's a little, and it also would also be the first like kind of frigate that can board, at least for Armada 2, because in all honesty, all the frigates were able to board as well. They were just not really good at it. You just had a weaker modifier, but they were still able to board most ships there. There were some other restrictions, I believe, as well. So they couldn't board, like, ships that were still at full health. I think you had to damage or cripple them, I think. But alas, that is the la all there is to really show about the Drukhari ships there. But, like I said plenty of times already, there's a lot to be excited about. There's also, with the new mechanics alone, never mind the ships that they have available that can are free to take full advantage of what uh, Games Workshop has for these the craft world as well as the Drukhari type fleets in general. Uh, there isn't really much info I can understand about the Titanic type of ships that are available to us besides for the craft worlds themselves, mind you, but those things are supposed to house the population, the life of the traditions of the Eldar, and not so much as be a warship, so it's hard to really imagine how that will really play in the campaign, a single player campaign, mind you. It might have some powerful utilities available to it, but as like a, a true warship, it's not going to have really weaponry on hell. It's, it's more than likely if Eldar make it into a campaign as a playable campaign, you're probably going to be required to keep that thing alive and not lose it in any condition at all. Although I imagine for the other Titanic ships, it might require you to keep them alive as well, so that probably is not really relevant. But how it would play out in game will be different than like the Phalanx or the McCraig's Honor. So thank you everyone for listening to this. It's been a really long rant. A little bit mixed up nonetheless. Hopefully I can improve on that and next time I'm going to talk a little bit about the Orcs and the Tyranids. The two factions that are potentially going to have a ridiculous amount of customization options. Especially the Tyranids.